If you want to see heaven, if you want to see kingdom authority, there must be surrender. The more you surrender, the more of heaven you'll see. Then the supernatural will become more natural. Anybody want some power? Anybody want some victory? Anybody want some deliverance? Anybody want to see some heaven? Well, then give God the glory by giving Jesus the honor. It is normal for us to conclude our prayers with in Jesus' name. And yet for many of us, when we conclude our prayers that way, we just canceled out our request because it was forgery. It was an illegitimate use of his name. Yet it is the most important phrase in a prayer. When you conclude your prayer in Jesus' name, it determines whether you get what you ask for or whether you don't. Jesus makes an astounding statement. He says, when you ask for anything in my name, you will receive it. Yet we all can testify that we've used the name and not got what we asked for. Well, what I want us to look at today is whether we've been using it legally or illegally. Because the use of the name and its legitimacy or lack thereof will determine whether we get what we pray for if we pray at all. So I want to look at three things. Because if you grab what I share with you today, you will see prayers answered like you've never seen them before. You'll see kingdom authority leave eternity and come in the time, leave heaven and come down to earth, leave the infinite and join the finite because we will have made contact with eternity. Now the first thing we've got to answer is, what is this concept? What is this principle of in my name. What, what, what does that even mean? To understand that, we have to understand a little bit of theology here. God has already determined that what he does in history on earth where you and I live, he will do by means of Jesus Christ. God has established a mechanism a means through a person to connect the two realms. That's why 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there is one mediator, one in-between person, between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, says that Jesus ever lives to be the intercession, interconnection point between us and God. The Bible says he mediates or brings to bear the promises of God, Hebrews chapter eight, verse six. So the word of God, the ways of God are mediated or transferred by and through the person of Jesus Christ. When we talk about his name, we're not talking about his nomenclature alone. We're talking about the person who stands behind the name. So when you talk about in the name of Jesus, you need to know the Jesus whose name you just used. It can't just be the word, it has to be the authorized use of the person whose name you just used called. Just because you authorize don't mean you can do your thing. I have authorized you to do my thing for my good on my behalf so you best get my okay. If you go out there on your own, I find another power of attorney. What he was saying is I will give you authority as long as I'm authorizing how you're using it. Because the moment you use it in an unauthorized way, you lose my backing of the authorization I put on loan to you. When you pray to the Father, 
without the backing of the son, you don't get the support of the son in the request you made to the father. But now let me give you the good news. The good news is that God the father never turns down God the son. There's only one time when God the father turned down God the son and that's when he bore our sins on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. God turned down the son because he was bearing our sin. That's the only time that has happened. That, was, that is the only time it ever could happen again. It can never happen again. God never turns down Jesus. So here's the deal. You want to make sure what you're praying for, Jesus is praying for. Because if what you're praying for is what Jesus is praying for, since the Father never turns down the Son, then what you're praying for, that Jesus is praying for, that the Father always accepts, becomes an answer prayer for you. So you've got to have a link between your prayer, His name, and the request you make to the Father. The question on the floor is not whether you're using the nomenclature, but whether you're using it in an authorized way. Because an unauthorized use of his name means a meaningless prayer request. Because the father loves the son and responds to the son. Then he responds to us who have responded to the son who the father responds to. So, he makes the statement that to use the name, you must use it in an authorized way. Number two, what are the prerequisites for me being able to use the name legitimately and with kingdom authority so that I can get heaven to come down into my history and to blow my mind, to answer my prayers, to respond to my requests. God demands total surrender. Romans chapter 14 verses eight and nine says Jesus lived and Jesus died to control all of your life. Not a part of it, not Sunday morning. He wants Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, back Sunday again, 24 seven, and everything you do in each one of those minutes of each one of those days. Now that's what he wants. Now we know we're not perfect people, but he wants that to be the mindset, the mentality, the orientation, if you expect him to listen to your prayers. If you are a part-time Christian, don't expect big-time answers. He demands total surrender. It is submission to his lordship. Or as Luke 6.46 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? So in other words, you can't say Lord and rebel. Because if you say Lord and rebel, the word Lord was wasted conversation. Lord means you are now my master. I am now your servant and slave. I am here to do what you say do, whether I prefer it, want it, like it, or not. It is the absence of lordship that keeps prayers unanswered. It is the absence of his comprehensive rule because God knows that we're gonna pick and choose what we like, pick and choose what we want, so he doesn't have total control. He has some commitment sometime. And he wants absolute, complete surrender. When you look at Colossians chapter three, you find something very interesting. Beginning in verse 17, listen to these words. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let me read that again. Whatever you do in word, what you say, or deed, what you do, because we're always saying or doing something, do all, not some, in the name of the Lord Jesus. When you decide my whole life is owned by him. Let me quote another verse. You won't like it, but I need to quote it. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Hold on to your seatbelt because this will rock your world. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. 
You don't get to own you once you become a Christian. You don't get to own you. He says, you are not your own. I bought and paid for you with my blood on the cross. So don't say what you're going to do when I say something different. You don't own you. See, the problem with too many of us is we still own ourselves. And if you own you, he doesn't own you. And if he doesn't own you, why don't you pray to you? Because you own you. He says you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. If you are willing to give up ownership of your life, now you can have access and kingdom authority in prayer. You can see God move. But he goes on and then he breaks it down. Just so you're not thinking about church. He says, verse 18, husbands, be the kind of husband I want you to be because I'm your Lord. Children, be the kind of child I want you to be because verse 20 says, because I'm your Lord. He goes to 21, fathers, be the kind of father I want you to be because I'm your Lord. Then he goes to the workplace. He says, servants, when you go to work tomorrow, be the kind of worker I want you to be because I'm your Lord. Whatever you do, he says, verse 23, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is Jesus Christ, the Lord, whom you serve. You don't serve the man. You work for the man, but you serve the Lord. You don't even get to go to work tomorrow morning without Jesus being Lord. He wants to own your home, your life, your money, your time, your efforts, your work. You mean he wants it all? Hello. <laughs> he wants total ownership. Uh, if you want answered prayer, if you want to see heaven, if you want to see kingdom authority manifested in your life, if you want to see the rule of God demonstrated, there must be be surrender for kingdom authority to be realized. Again, kingdom authority is the divinely authorized right and responsibility for believers to act on God's behalf and spiritually ruling over his creation under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Listen, the more you surrender, the more of heaven you'll see. Dr. Evans will be right back after this important announcement. The threat of global catastrophe looms over us. Earthquakes, fires. It seems like the world is falling into turmoil. Are you ready to face Armageddon? Dr. Tony Evans' latest book, Thy Kingdom Come, emerges as a light amidst the sin-ridden depths of our world, guiding you through the murky waters of uncertainty. Within these insightful pages, wisdom intertwines with revelation. You'll dive deep into the mysteries of enigmatic prophecy, where solace awaits the weary soul. Dr. Tony Evans' unparalleled mastery in deciphering the complexities of Scripture will ensure clarity in the face of confusion and illuminate the path towards hope. Arm yourself against the impending storm and let not the hour of reckoning catch you unaware. Be prepared for what's to come by picking up your copy of Thy Kingdom Come at TonyEvans.org. Comes with a bonus sermon series, Staying Right With God. Do not be caught off guard. So that's why growth in intimacy is critical to experiencing his authority. You want to draw near to him. You want to get close to him. That's why the scripture talks about how much the father loves the son. They are so into each other that they never turn each other down because they're so into each other. He wants us to be into him like that. That's why 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7 says, you abide in me and my word abide in you. Ask me whatever you want to and I will do it for you because we hang out together. How does this work? It works like this. Whatever the father thinks, the son thinks exactly the same thing because they're always on the same page. Whatever the father thinks that the son thinks, the Holy Spirit thinks, because he's part of the triune God, so they're always on the same page. The closer you get to the Lord, whatever the Father thinks, Son thinks, that the Spirit thinks, because he renews our mind, we think. So we begin to think what the Spirit thinks, that's exactly what the Son thinks, that's exactly what the Father thinks. So 
When you get on your knees and pray, you can only pray for what you think. But if the Spirit has affected what you think, and it's the same thing that the Son thinks, that's the same thing that the Father thinks, they got to answer your prayer because you're all praying for the same thing. Because you have now come on a divine wavelength. Because you've drawn near to him, close to him, you've settled the lordship issue. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. You can't have the Lord and anything as a final decision maker. Let me put it this way. It's not enough to believe in God. That, that's, that's not good enough when it comes to having God move on earth. He moves on earth through his son. So your belief in God and love of God and appreciation of God, that's nice, but it's not sufficient for intervention in history. That comes through Christ. If you want intervention in history, then Jesus Christ, you must be willing to be identified with him. To call on his name in the day of trouble means you have publicly confessed him before men. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he says if you... If you confess with your mouth, that is open declaration that I am a, I'm a committed Christian, I belong to Jesus Christ, open declaration, not hidden. He says, those who call on me, who have confessed, he says, will be delivered. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. In other words, anything that's going to make me and my daddy look good, I'm going to do. Glorified. If, if you're going to make me look good by your prayer request, I want you to tell God if he answers your request, what he'll get out of it. Because God loves to hear his glory on display. He loves to know he'll be glorified in the process. His name will be great. First John Chapter 5 has something very interesting. First John says this in chapter 5. John says in verse 13, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know, keep the word know in mind, that you have eternal life. So when you place faith alone in Christ alone, he gives you an inner confidence of your salvation, a conviction that you're his child. But now notice what he says right after that, verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him. So the word confidence, the word no. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked from him. Ooh, you see how many times I've said the word no? That is inner persuasion or confidence. Anybody been waiting for something for a while? Okay, well the first question is are you praying in his name, okay? Are you surrendered, okay? But given that, when there is a gap of time between a legitimate prayer in Jesus' name, the knowing that he's going to answer, but the lapse in time between the answer, it is for one reason and one reason alone, preparation. Either God is preparing it for you or he's preparing you for it or he's preparing the two for each other. It is for preparation. God will use whatever time is needed for the preparation to occur, for the request to be answered, and you to be qualified to receive the request when it comes. Now that's the good news. The bad news is you can delay the time because you can delay the preparation. You can decide I'm not going to be surrendered. You can decide I'm not going to obey. You can decide, I'm not, and you can just spend that time on. So God may have decided I'm gonna, it's going to take one year, and you may be at 25 years. 
because he never got the surrender, so you never got the preparation, so he could never answer. It should have taken Israel about a month, a month and a half to leave Egypt and get to the promised land. They walking around in circles for 40 years because they never accepted the preparation that the wilderness was designed to give. He says, there is a knowing that occurs when we are in framework with God. It's powerful for, watch this, physical and spiritual healing. James chapter five, verses 13 to 15. He says, if you pray in the name of the Lord, the prayer will heal the sick, okay? And address the sin. Ooh, ooh. The prayer will heal the sick and address the sin. Now all sickness is not due to sin, but a lot of sickness is. He says, the prayer of faith. He says, in the name of the Lord. So he brings the name in. Will heal the sick and it will deal with the sin. What God is saying is, if I could ever get to the spiritual, we could do a lot better with the physical. Most of our prayers, once we want God to change stuff in the physical. Give me more money. Give me better health. Give me a new car. Give me a new house. Give me nice clothes. Give me, you know, yeah, we want God to do something in the physical. And, and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But we often want him to do stuff in the physical without touching the spiritual. Don't touch my sin, but give me my blessing. Don't touch my rebellion, but give me my blessing. No, he doesn't mind changing the physical, but he wants to address the spiritual. And that brings in a monster authority. Kingdom authority? You want to know kingdom authority? The name of Jesus gives you power over the devil. Because much of what we deal with has come from him or through him or by him. In Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 19, he told his disciples, <laughs> here he's having a conversation with his disciples and he says, you have authority over the devil in my name. You tread among the demons. You tread on top of the demons. Instead of the devil and the demons walking on you, you walking on them. Tread means to walk on. When's the last time you walked on the devil? Just, just walked on. Oh, devil, let me walk on you. Rather than him walking over you. He says, I give you authority. He used the word authority to tread on the devil and his demonic scorpions. Why? Because many of the issues we have are demonically exacerbated. See, we think the problem in the divorce was our personalities. That wasn't the problem. The problem is the devil got a hold of your personalities. And when the demons got a hold of your personalities, your personalities got amped up. In chapter 19 of Acts, I, I love this. Verse 13 and 17, okay. Paul is casting out demons in Jesus' name. He's just getting rid of demons in Jesus' name. He just, just the sick of being healed, the supernatural is occurring regularly in Jesus' name. Well, some dudes see this. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul using this name Jesus and stuff happening. Why don't we do that? Because they concluded there's magic in his name. It's a magical name here. Paul doing all this stuff in Jesus' name. So they came to this demon-possessed person, the sons of Sceva. They came as Jesus' this person, and they used the name of Jesus. They do like Christians do, Jesus, 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 Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. They, they, went, they, went, they, they went Jesus on them, just, just Jesus all over the place. Just Jesus. Come out, demon. Then Acts 19 says the demon spoke up. Demon spoke up. And the demon says, Jesus we know. Paul we know. We don't know who you folks are. It says the demon jumped out of the man and jumped on to the folk who was using the name of Jesus. Stripped them of their clothes 
And it says, and they ran out naked. Why? Because when you don't know how to use the name, and you still use the name, you just invite the devil to jump all over you and make things worse on you while you call in Jesus' name. So Jesus' name is not a name to be played with. Nor is it, is it dice, is it magic you just throw out there. Uh -uh. This is a person behind the name. And if you don't know the person submitted to the person, intimate with the person, following the person, yielding to the person, submitted to the person, don't expect the power. The power comes from a person. When you get on your knees to pray, and you go to your heavenly father and say, Father, I want this, I need this. Help me over here, deliver me over there. God has a question, show me your ID. Upon what right and authority do you have right now to come to my throne and to make this request and to expect me to let you in to my holy throne? Where is your ID? And oh, if you understand the name of Jesus, you got an ID. Just like when it comes time to go to heaven, and if uh, Peter would say, on what ground should I let you into glory? I hope you don't say my good works. I hope you don't say I'm a nice person, because that'll get...